Good morning, everyone. Am I muted? Can you hear me? Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I'm supposed to send some feedback to some of us. I've responded to some and I haven't. So if you've not gotten my feedback, don't worry, I'm still working on it, okay? And then by this coming Wednesday, We'll be using that class to, I'll be in school, so you can come by to pick up any outstanding lab or assignment script that would be with me, because I try to give it out. Not every one of us has picked up us. So we'll just use that to pick it up, then settle every uh, concern about grade issue, not seeing your score on a particular assignment you did or module and all that, okay? So that's what we'll be using our lab time for the next Wednesday to do. And we hope to set everything about grade and scores before the exam. So we know that the only outstanding will be the exams, okay? So today, I want to look at the very last part of our, uh, not the very last part, the first and the last, because on, on Wednesday will be, the, will be the concluding class. So we are looking at the chapter 13, which is fluids, okay? And in looking at the subject fluids, we'll be focusing on uh, other sub subjects such as density and pressure, okay? We we'll also look at the buoyancy, which is the last lab we did. We had to do that lab and take this course because they are important and is because it's part of the exam question. So we had to cover it. And it's part of our scheme as well. So we're looking at pressure and liquid. We will learn about hydrostatic uh, pressures. We will learn when liquid is at equilibrium. We will also look at buoyancy, which is not a new subject to us because we have done lab on it. We will learn how to find the buoyancy force and apply the Archimedes principle to floating objects. We may not look at the very last part, which is the circulatory system. So we'll just leave that out. Otherwise, it would have been that we'll look at the circulatory system and because we, want, we just want to cut down on the load and not make you read what really is not part of your exam. But it's important for knowledge sake to see how that pressure density 
and uh, the principle we know about fluid applies to the dynamics of the circulatory system of the human body. Actually, this is the physics of the biological sciences. It's so interesting. At your spare, you can read it up. It's just three pages of your test. So our goal will be to understand the static and dynamic properties of fluid. Okay. Although our examples will be taken in this course uh, on this topic is focusing on the static, but we will just make mention of the dynamic property of fluids. So you take note of that when we do mention that. So we'll begin our class today by looking at fluids and density. None of this is a new term to us. We have seen density, we have measured density in the lab, we have calculated it theoretically for some objects, but we'll just look at it again briefly. So a fluid is simply a substance that flow. Whenever we talk about fluid, we are referring to substance that flow. And because it flows, it takes the shape of the container you put it in. It takes any form of that container that is inside. And so we define fluid to be both gas and liquid. Okay, so it's not just liquid that is fluid. We have regard gases as fluid as well because they flow. All right. So, but in looking at both gases and fluid, the similarities is more important to us than the differences. Okay. We also know that fluid is dynamic in the sense that it can it is incompressible, unlike the gas. So we we'll also look at the, that dynamics of the fluid as well and factor it in, in our discourse of the fluid and density property, okay? Although the molecules of fluid are closely packed and incompressible, that does not mean they are not rubbing off on each other or asserting a kind of uh, collision with one another. All right, but it's not as in the case of gas, where we see that, because I've looked at gas before, the simple model of gas and liquid, you see the, the gases, the molecules colliding, okay, and also colliding with the wall of their container. But for the liquid, when we see, this is the case of the model for gas, for the molecule of gas, Look at that of the liquid. There's something unique about it. It has a well-defined surface, unlike the gas. Now, the molecules are you know, rubbing on each other as they flow, but they are really incompressible. So the weak bond between each of these molecules, keep them close together. But as the molecule slides on each other, it allows the liquid to flow, and then it takes eventually the shape of the container it's flowing into. All right. So if we have a liquid that we can say this is the volume of the liquid and we can put a mass to it, we can actually look for its density. The symbol for density is rho, which is what you have here. And density expression is given as mass over volume. Okay, so we'll have the mass density of an object uh, to be the mass, the ratio of the mass to its volume. All right, so from this ratio, you'll be able to tell the unit of density, unit of mass in kg and volume in meter uh, cube. Okay, so whenever we say density, we're actually referring without specifying the type of density, because if it is not the, the mass density that we are referring to, we have to put an addendum to the density definition or name. We say things like area density, linear density, relative density. When 
the description of the density is not mass density. But when you hear the word density without an addendum, we are referring to mass density. And the unit is kilogram per meter cube. Okay. So if you look at density, you see something about the parameters that we use to measure density, the mass and the volume. There are parameters that characterize the specific property of that substance, okay? But density itself, the you know, mass and volume can vary, but density itself characterizes the substance itself, so it does not vary. If you have a, a piece of copper, for example, and you break it into 10, when they were together as one, and when they were in pieces, the density will not change. The density of a piece will be also equal to that of the whole. Okay, so the unique characteristic of density that you should note is that it characterizes the substance itself and density is independent of size. Okay, so if you break an object into pieces, it still has its density. And that is why we can say uh, have specific values for density of some object as shown in this table. Look at that of gases and see air when measured at 20 degrees Celsius and air when measured at zero degrees Celsius. You see the value for their density. They are somewhat uh, different, okay? Because of the temperature at which they were measured. Okay, so we also see the density of water for sea water and look at that of blood, look at that of oil. So these ones are really the ones who apply in some of the examples will be seen. So like I said, if you are given any question and would need you to use uh, these values, it will be provided as constant, okay? So we'll just get used to how they are applied to solving problems. So let's look at an example. Okay. The question says, what is the mass of air in a living room with dimension four meters by six meters by 2.5 meters? They give us the dimension of that room and they're asking us to look for the mass of air in it. Okay. So we know, as provided in the table above, which I just presented, the density of air that is measured at 20 degrees Celsius, which is about the uh, temperature of the room. It is given to be 1.2 uh, kilo, kilogram per meter cube. That is the density of air at that temperature. So. We can, from the parameters given, look for the volume. Volume is the L cube, length times rest times height of that room. And we have our volume to be 60 meter cube. So the mass of air from density rho being equal to MV, if we make, because we're looking for mass, if we make M the subject of formula, we'll have rho V as our density. So that's how we got this equation for mass, okay? For as our mass, sorry. That's how we got the equation for mass. So if we substitute our values, which is the density of air at that temperature and the volume that we have just calculated, we see that the mass of air in that room is 72 kilogram. See the application is a straightforward one, okay? So, I'm just going to quickly launch a pool from our brief discussion now. What do we think will be the solution to this question? One minute to do that, then we'll proceed. Okay. A piece of glass is broken into two pieces of different sizes, rank in order from largest to, uh, to smallest, the density of piece one, two, and three. Okay. 
Uh, can you see the pool? Yeah, we're good. Okay. I'm still expecting three persons to respond. What you're ranking is actually the density, not the size. So put that in mind, okay? Rank in order of largest to smallest, the densities. Good, everybody has responded. All right, thank you. So from what we just discussed, we said that density is independent of size. Okay, so if you we use the example of a copper, if you break it into 10 pieces, the density when it was one piece is equal to the density of each piece. Reason being that density characterizes the, the substance itself and not depending on the size. Okay, so the answer will be B, one will be equal to two, will be equal to three, no matter how further you split this into their density will just remain the same. So that is one thing about density that I don't want you to forget, okay? So we we'll move to another aspect of our discourse today, which is pressure. We have seen uh, pressure briefly in our chapter 12, and we define pressure to be what? Uh, force per unit area, okay? And we gave analogy of how the pressure, we use gas in our discussion in chapter 12, but here we're going to see how it applies to fluids. And by saying fluid, it means we are just including liquid in that discussion, okay? Because a gas is also a fluid. It means we're just applying the dynamics for fluid to the discussion of pressure. Because we have seen it for gas. We just want to see how it applies in, in fluid like liquid, okay? So we said that in our description for in chapter 12, that the force will act at certain area, okay? So let's see in this figure that is before us, the fluid in a container, there will be pressure in that container such that the, the, the force will be pushing to some areas of that container everywhere on that contact surface. There'll be a force pressing against certain area of that container. So if we pick a molecule of fluid, we'll see, we'll be able to define an area to where the force is pushing on the, the container walls, okay? So the definition of our pressure still holds and the unit for pressure is simply Pascal. And one Pascal means one Newton for force and area meter cube, okay? So when we talk about pressure in fluid, it's actually due to the, the force, several force within the fluid and the one acting on the surface, all right? So the pressure pushes, if we, if we imagine putting a hole in a cylinder that has what are seen in this figure B, we puncture some holes on that cylinder. The pressure pushes on the fluid such that the, the fluid will find a way to exit through those holes. And that will keep happening as long as pressure is acting and the fluid can find exit route. Okay? So it is actually pressure that helps us to control flow, the understanding of pressure and area in addition to force that can help us to control flow. And that is what informed the design of some pipes that we use in our houses today. So how do we measure pressure? We have the instrument we use to measure pressure is like uh, the barometer and they have several designs of it. But we just want to look at a typical one that can be used, that we can just use to learn the basics of uh, pressure and how it's been measured. Now we'll have a simple de 
device here that we use to measure pressure. And how is it designed? It's a vacuum inside and a piston attached to spring. The spring constant for this spring is known. When they throw this instrument into the fluid, nothing is inside, remember? The fluid will exert force on the piston, okay? The piston area is defined. So you know the area, you know the spring constant. From the information supplied when you throw this instrument into the fluid and the force is exerted, it's going to compress the spring, all right? When it compresses that spring, you'll be able to find force. The constant is known, the area is known, the compression can be measured as the piston moves, you'll be able to measure the distance covered. So from there, we can determine force, okay? And then we'll now apply it to the formula pressure, which is a force over area. Once we have determined force from uh, Hooke's law, using the spring constant, the distance covered and the, the area equation, okay? So another thing we want to emphasize when measuring pressure is that regardless of where or which side you, the, the measuring device is placed, the pressure it will measure will be the same. But there's something about pressure we want to mention. That pressure, that this is the characteristic of pressure I want you to keep in mind, it increases with depth, okay? The pressure on the surface of a liquid is not the same as the pressure at the depth 10 meters or 10, 20 meters or 100 down. As it's going down, the pressure is increasing. Okay, so if we throw several measuring devices as seen in A into this fluid, okay, it's going to measure, it can measure the pressure at different depths in this fluid. But at the depth of the fluid, you see different, the pressure facing different directions, they will have the same reading. So regardless of if they are facing up sideways or down, they will measure the same value because the pressure within the fluid is what is, is being measured. Okay. So uh, we, have, we have point out that the equation of pre pressure force over area, well, we have established that pressure also increases with depth. Then we want to look at when you have your barometer, the one used to measure the pressure in your tires, what is that actually measuring? Is it this kind of pressure in fluid? Okay, so that is what we want to now look at. And that brings us to the uh, term actual or absolute pressure. Sometimes when you see the word absolute pressure, they put the word actual pressure to describe that, okay? And simply actual pressure, they are pressure reading where the value start from absolute zero, okay? It's starting from zero, the start point. Once you start measuring, it's zero. So we'll have some uh, instrument that measures absolute pressure and we'll have the regular one, which we call the gauge pressure, the one you use for your tires. And what the gauge pressure actually measures is not the absolute pressure. And that's why it has the name gauge pressure. It's measuring, the start point is not zero. That's one of the difference. It's starting from the atmospheric pressure, okay? So we'll have atmospheric pressure, absolute pressure, and gauge pressure. We have seen that the absolute pressure, which is uh, actual pressure, starts from zero. It is the pressure you measure in a complete or perfect va vacuum. Why the atmospheric pressure is the pressure of the gas or in the air in the atmosphere around us, which varies. And because of this variation, we compute the pressure we measure uh, with our barometer regularly from this. And that is giving us the P, which is uh, the pressure gauge, is equal to the actual pressure minus the atmospheric 
pressure. Um, sorry. Atmospheric pressure. So this is the what the pressure gauge is measuring. So the difference between the three is clear. This one is the measurement in the upper fat vacuum in air and for your gauge system. Okay. So just to point out the, the difference between those two. And also we have that one atmospheric pressure is given to be one with in subtest, we just put 101 kilopascal, but the full value is actually 101, 300 Pascal, that is uh, 101,300 uh, Pascal. Okay. So let's look at pressure in fluid. We have said some general things about pressure. We have seen pressure in fluid establishing that it's increasing with depth. So let's see how that applies. Now let's imagine, as we see in this figure, a container filled with water. We now have another uh, tube or cylinder filled also with, with water or say the same fluid placed inside. So you have the big one and you have the small one here. The depth of that small one is defined as D. We see that the, the, the fluid floats or it's, it's not touching the base of that water because we have another force that is acting on it, that is pushing it forward. And the force acting on it, pushing it forward is because the force at this depth is higher than the force at this depth, okay? So it's going to push it up, all right? So for this fluid, we, we have on the surface, the atmosphere will act on it. We, we take that as P naught, that is pressure from the atmosphere and the area of the tube being defined. So we have a, a, okay, then the pressure from the base acting on it, pushing it forward, product of A, uh, P and area, All right? So if we do, uh, we look at critically this, we'll see that the fluid as it is right now, it's in static equilibrium. And that gives us, and information about the forces that we're acting on this fluid, giving the idea of the basic principle of how forces are distributed within fluid, just what uh, pressure force that we saw earlier are distributed within fluids. So we want to see how we can measure this at depth D. If we do the free body diagram, the, this force is acting on this side, and this is acting on this side, so they cancel out. And that is why it's not showing in our free body diagram. So we'll have the force acting upward, which is the PA, the one pushing the fluid, causing it to float, and then the weight of the fluid acting downward, and the surface pre pressure area pushing, acting on the surface also acting downwards. So if we use the principle that for static equilibrium system, the net force is equal to zero. If we apply it, it simply means the force acting down balances with the force acting up. That is what we mean by net force is equal to zero. So if we bring out our forces, we see the force acting up uh, as the pressure and area for up being equal to, it's going to balance with these two, this plus this, all right. So for, from the information given, you know, pressure, we're working towards pressure, pressure is mass over V, okay? We can actually determine our V as the area times the distance that will already give us the L cube for volume. So, Area in this, uh, volume in this case, is area times the distance D. The area is given for multiply with the distance, we get the volume. And if the volume is area times the distance D, 
and we said mass is equal to rho v, we can actually substitute this into this equation. Mass is equal to rho v from the formula for density. All right. So if we put this into the equation for volume, mass becomes uh, equal to rho, which is density, times area times distance, d, or depth, d. Therefore, if you put that straight out into this equation, this mass, put it here, you will have PA equal to P naught A. You know what PA is, pressure from acting on the, from the base, equal to the surface pressure plus substitute for M. A D G, right? So A goes off. You will now have your pressure being equal to the atmospheric pressure plus rho density G D. That's how we got this. So this, therefore, is the equation for the pressure of liquid with density. This is rho at the depth D. So this is the equation that we will bring out if you are given such any question on the pressure and liquid, this is the kind of equation you will see at the, in, uh, on your formula sheet. You'll be the one to, from the question and parameters given to know how to bring out your D, MG and all that, because we will not bring this one out. They are not like standard formulas to be presented, okay? They are derived formulas to get to achieve an aim. All right. So that's how we got the pressure for liquid with density rho at, at depth uh, D. Okay. So let's take an example. A submarine cruises at a depth of 300 meters. What is the pressure at this depth? So I should give you an answer in both Pascal and atmosphere, uh, atmospheric pressure or yeah, atmospheric pressure reading. So the P naught is the atmospheric pressure on the surface, which is given as uh, 101 kilopascal. And the density of the seawater is given as this. The question is, you should find or tell us the pressure at depth 300 meters. So the pressure at depth 300 meters is going to vary from the pressure at depth 100 because we said pressure actually increases with depth. Okay, if it goes beyond 100, uh, 300 is also going to vary. So if we apply the equation of pressure that we have just seen for fluid at depth, okay, whenever we're talking about a factor in the depth, in the description of pressure, that is when we apply this equation, okay? And we see that there's something about the equation that is bringing in the G, and you know what G is, which is acceleration due to gravity. It is actually emphasizing the point that the pressure you measure about fluid in, in respect to depth is actually as a result of the gravitational pull of that liquid or weight of that liquid towards uh, the X. When you pour a liquid in the bottle, the reason the liquid will fill the bottom first before the top is because as you are pouring it, the force of gravity is pulling that liquid to the base, pulling it to itself so it settles at the base before it fills the top, okay? So that is what that G is emphasizing in that equation. So applying the equation directly, we have the peanuts as a standard value provided to us in the question. The density of C sort also a standard constant value. G is a constant value. So the only varying value here is the depth. So multiplying that through, we have 3.13 times 10 raised to power C Pascal. We now want to express our answer in the atmospheric value as uh, stated in the question that we should do. 
one atmospheric pressure is given to be this. Okay, so this will now be one atmospheric pressure divided by the standard value of atmospheric pressure in Pascal. Okay, so this over this is eventually what we'll get, this over Pascal atmospheric value to have 30.9 uh, atmospheric value. If you want to take this one back, you simply multiply by the unit of Pascal here to get back this equation. Okay, so we have also some fluids with a unique shape and processes that we want to quickly look at. When we look at liquid in a connecting tube, how do we interpret the pressure in such liquid? For connecting tube, we see that when you, when you pour, you have a fluid that will to open end, you're pouring liquid on one side. The liquid keeps flowing, flowing until, when you're done pouring, it flows back and balances such that they will maintain the same level. Okay, so they have the same distance and they maintain the same level. So the connected uh, liquid will be in hydrostatic equilibrium. So raises to the same height. And at that point, we'll have the pressure in one to be equal to the pressure in, on, in the other one. Now, if we have liquid of different shapes, you know, the first one looks like they have the same shape, but different sizes, the cylinder. What happens when you have uh, uh, a, a connecting fluid, a connecting tube with different shape, just like you have here, like a cone and a cylinder? The same thing will happen. You keep pouring it, and you're done pouring, it comes to a point that the level, they will be the same, they will rise up and adjust to be the same height. The pressure at the point, or the same horizontal point will be equal as well. Now this apply for liquid, uniform uh, liquid as a liquid of the same density. If we have a mixture of liquid or with different density, a different approach applies, okay? So let's see an example. For the case where the example we're taking is one where we'll have the, the side of the bent tube sealed, okay? So I've established that the pressure at the same point of the liquid is equal. We'll apply that to solving our problem. So water fills the tube as shown in this figure. What is the pressure at the top of the closed tube here. What is the pressure here? So what, to solve this problem, they give us this is 100 and this is 40. So the difference between this place is what? 60 cm, all right? Take note of the unit, 60 cm. So if, as we've, we've been given in our standard, uh, values that the one atmospheric pressure is 101 kilo pascal. So to solve this, we know that the pressure here and here will be equal. And the question is saying, what is the pressure at the top of the closed tube? That means the pressure on this, that is the pressure that will be at the top of this closed fluid. So at point of uh, 40 cm, the bottom that on the open part, they'll have the same pressure, but we'll have that the fluid on top of 40 is 60. So we'll convert our 60 cm to meter, we'll have 0 0.60 meters, that's this value, okay? So if we apply that to, because the pressure is about a depth uh, pressure calculation, to the standard equation, we have all the parameters are constant for water, to specify it as water that's filling it, this is the uh, density of water. 
this is constant, this is constant. This is the depth we are looking at. So multiplying that out, we have the value in, spa, in Pascal and in, 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 in Pascal and in atmospheric pressure reading. So the pressure acting on this is the pressure at this depth, okay? So calculating that will have 1.06 atmospheric reading. So if you leave your answer in Pascal or atmospheric reading, you will have your full score. So we have been saying Pascal, 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 the Pascal's principle. What does Pascal have to say about the description of pressure that we have been talking about? Pascal's principle says, if the pressure at one point in an incompressible fluid is changed, the pressure at every other point in that fluid will also change by the same, not the word, the same amount. So Pascal's principle is simply saying the pressure in a fluid, an incompressible fluid is uniform, is the same, okay? It can vary with depth, but when you look at the ratio, it will be the same. So let's look at another example. We mentioned earlier that when we see uh, different fluid, fluids of different density filling in a tube or being filled with a tube, bent or straight, we will have a, a kind of different distribution of pressure in such fluid. So this example will just emphasize that principle for us and we'll progress to discussing the next thing, which is buoyancy. So we'll have the YouTube shape uh, image here. We'll fill it with, with uh, water and oil. Water is heavier than oil, so they don't miss. Oil will eventually float on top water, okay? So the height of the oil above the point where the, the two fluid touches each other is 75, you can see that. Why the height of the closed end of the tube above the point yeah, is 25? What is the gauge pressure at the close, you see? they emphasize gauge pressure. And I gave you the formula for gauge, pre gauge pressure, right? Which is equal to minus the atmospheric pressure. Actual pressure, if you remember that diagram, you should know. Actual pressure minus, okay? We will look at that and see also how we'll use the standard pressure of uh, equation to achieve that. So look very closely at this diagram. At this point, we said they are the same. See, this side is the same fluid. They will have the same pressure, okay? But at this point, it's not going to be the same. Why? The pressure of oil is different from that of water. So that principle here will not apply at these two points. Okay, so this is what we're going to look at to do our calculation. It simply means that the pressure here at this distance is equal to this one. That is the pressure that can rest on top of these two fluids. Because this one is lighter, you see it covers a higher volume. It appears to cover a higher volume, but the pressure is the same because their density varies. So that's why they vary in height in that tube. So how do we solve this problem? The pressure at the point one will have 75 cm this one below this end. If we use the first to solve the pressure at this point, the standard equation of the, the pressure at the depth to calculate it, substituting directly with all the constants given, okay? The depth above, will tell us the pressure here will have P1 to be one atmospheric pressure plus C62 Pascal here. We can choose if the question gives us the value for atmospheric pressure, we'll substitute it directly into that, okay? And even if we say, okay, I still remember the value for atmospheric pressure and I put it there, you put the value, you also be given the, the grade, okay? So we'll have one atmospheric pressure 
plus this. And the pressure in one will be equal to the pre pressure in two. So using that to derive the pressure in three, P2 will be, which is equal to P3 plus, remember, the same way the height above, to calculate this one, the height above this is what we are using, which is P3. That is where P3 is coming into the question. Times the pressure for, this is for oil. The, for the density for oil, you see here, we use the density for oil because oil is the fluid above this, or water is the fluid above 0.2. So we'll have this, then the standard, then the distance from this diagram to calculate the point of P2. But what we've already known that the point of P2 is equal to point of P1 because they are the same fluid at this point. So we we'll equate this to this to determine our P3, all right? So equating those two that we have just derived, we can determine our P3. So it becomes P2 minus being equal to P1 minus this. P2, this is our value for P1, and this is for P2. So P3 came into the expression if we make the P3 the subject of formula, we have that this is equal to P1 minus 240, uh, 2450 Pascal. And we express that also in one uh, atmospheric pr pressure times. If I write it out, let me write it out so that you see what we did. Um, equating one, 80 m plus 6620 being equal to p3 plus 2450 that is what we did if you make this one the subject of formula this will come here so you have one plus this minus this that is what you see here okay so if you solve that out this minus this will give you this value and we we'll bring this one down. This is now our P3. So remember the question is saying, you should look for what the gate pressure. So we know the value on our P3. So the gate pressure at P3 for the closed end of the tube is simply P3 minus, this is atmospheric pressure, or this gauge pressure being your P, actual pressure minus PG, atmospheric pressure, okay? So your, your, your pressure, atmosphere, I don't know why I'm writing ATM, yeah. Will now be your P, your gauge pressure being P3 minus this, this one will go minus this or minus this value to give you that as your gauge pressure for that equation. So this equation, this example simply buttresses the fact that uh, the pressure principle applies to differently when you have mixture of fluid. And this is simply the table showing us the basic unit of pressure. So this is another class exercise you want to do, which of these shows the, the correct expression for the mixture of these two. This, we chose this because it, from my example, you know that this water is heavier than oil. So at this point, you have the same pressure. The, the pressure or density here is equal to the density here. Okay, because the, the density pressure here because the density varies, this is lighter to occupy, it appears to occupy a larger volume than this. The same principle we use for that example is what we use to obtain the answer as C. So let's quickly use the four minutes to run through the, the buoyancy topic. Now we did an experiment in the lab about buoyancy. 
And buoyancy, which we have defined, we already have from the, some theories. Everything about buoyancy is what is captured in the theories for the last lab. So I want to say, or assume that we are familiar with some of the terms we'll be discussing here. Buoyancy is simply the force that is acting upward on a floating object. Okay, so we described earlier that for the when we're looking at the depth uh, of fluid, we describe a force that will float or push the object up, and the other forces that will be pushing the object down, causing the object to be at static equilibrium, such that when you obtain the net force, it's going to be net force will be equal to the force upward, even now to it the force downward which will eventually be force upward minus force downward being equal to net force or constant zero, depending on the system you are describing. So from this cylinder, we can see we have emphasized pressure increasing with depth. This is the force up and this is the force down. The net force acts in the direction of the object is floating, so the net force is acting upward. So net force, therefore, is what we refer to as buoyant force. The net force, which is the force that is pushing upward and causing that uh, object to float, is referred to as buoyant force. So the net force from this representation is our buoyant force, net force equal to buoyant force. So for buoyant force, we will see that the upward force must be greater than the downward force such that when you put, take all this one to the side, it will be equal to zero, a constant or the system balances out, okay? So we should note that this is as a result of the higher pressure that exists at the bottom of the fluid. It tend to push every object that is thrown into it upward, but some, some object has the potential to overcome that and they sink instead of floating. Now, Archimedes captured this perfectly, and that is how we use the word Archimedes principle to describe the process of buoyancy. And Archimedes principle says, a fluid exerts an upward buoyant force, by now you know what a buoyant force is, force such that the force upward is greater than that which is acting downwards. So a fluid exerts an buoyant force, Fb, on an object in mass, or floating on the fluid. The magnitude of the buoyant force is equal to the weight. Remember weight, we're not saying volume. Most of you confuse this for volume, it's not volume. The magnitude of the buoyant force equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. Weight of the fluid displaced by the object, okay? So when you displace a volume of fluid, that volume that is displaced is equal to the weight of the fluid. So we'll have the buoyant force matching the expression Fb being equal to weight of objects, okay? And it's given us the buoyant force being equal to density of a fluid, volume of a fluid, and G, you know how we got this. We have derived this before because we'll have force from second, Newton's second law to be mg, when the force is related to gravity. And we said that M from your row equal to MV, M is equal to V rho. So if you put that into this equation, you will have FB being equal to rho V and G. So that's how we got this expression for buoyancy. And I told you, it will always carry the G to show that the force of gravity is acting on it. So we we'll have an example here that is straightforward. I'd like you to look at. That's why we included it here. So you just look through. We use buoyant force to determine if the crown of a king is pure gold or not. Now we describe certain things about buoyant force. We describe something that is floating or immersed in water, we, di we didn't say so much about what sinks, but we know that whatever is sinking has the power to overcome the buoyant force. That's why it's going down to the, the 
downward force, the upward force is now not greater than downward force. So we see that quickly. For a sinking object, look at it. The average force going down is greater than the one going up, so it will sink. For a floating object, the one going up is greater than the one going down, so it will float. So for an object with natural buoyancy, it's submerged, but it's also floating. So you will have the average uh, density being equal of the object being equal to that of the fluid. Okay, and we want to emphasize that this principle applies to objects with a uniform density. So it applies a uniform shape. Okay, so if we have a non-uniform composition of objects, objects with varying density and shape, we will apply a different method to solving that. And that is what we see in your boats and balloons. They have varying shape. And we will use that basic principle that says the weight of the displaced water balances with the weight of the object. So we see the different buoyancy force for the displaced water. OK. So that's basically the summary of fluid, its pressure, and buoyancy force acting upward and downward. Are we good? If you have any comments, you know how to reach me through email, post on a chat or module, so we can schedule to meet to explain basic principle concerning this. Okay. Hello, is anyone there? Or oh, I'm just talking to myself. Yes, it's okay. All right. So enjoy your day. See you on Wednesday. Bye bye. Bye. Have a great day.